So thanks a lot everyone for joining uh, this webinar. So this webinar, we have a series of speakers that will be sharing with you in Metaverse and NFT and what is it like if this space is suitable for you. So without further ado, I hand the over sessions to Prof Kif. Okay, and uh, let me take over sharing. Welcome everyone. I'm really glad to be able to talk with you about the Metaverse and this is part two. Um, we have an exciting agenda for you, and these are some of the speakers. I will introduce them to you in a little bit, but they range from, well, it's quite a diverse range from Winston, uh, who's uh, in his teenage years, uh, on over to uh, someone who's calling in from Europe to share with us, uh, Monse. So we're really glad to have a, a variety and diversity for you to listen to today. Before I get into the actual session, though, I do want to highlight a resource that's available to you, which is at the Smart Nation um, website. They have some of the resources like the AR Storybook and other initiatives for you to take a look at and to participate in, like Smart Community and more. So highly recommend, don't miss out on this website if you're interested in getting to know more about what's happening and just being part of the Smart Nation, this is a awesome place and opportunity for you to get into. So thanks again for coming with us today on this journey. Here's our agenda. And we're gonna start off, of course, talking through what each one of us uh, is gonna be sharing. But in addition, we'd love for you to be able to hear a bit about What's the metaverse going to be? So I'm going to be sharing with you. What is it? How does it look? Then Winston will come in. Is the metaverse for you? The regulatory aspects Justin will talk about as a lawyer from Rajan Tan. What about NFTs from Broderick and the digital economy and startups from Monse? As was mentioned, please go ahead and ask us questions throughout uh, as well. And this is all about building a community. You know, you, we'd love for you to keep in touch, share with each other, connect. And at the end of the session, if you want to hang back a little bit with us, there'll be a hands-on, we'll end the session, but then there'll be an NFT hands-on session by one of the interns in the FinTech lab, Vignesh, who will take you through, you know, what do you do with that? They're a little bit cheaper now than they were in the last session. Well, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. The FinTech lab, I'm coming in from that. And, you know, FinTech's heavily integrated in everything we do is every area of our business. Any business that takes money or sends money to somebody is actually going to have some FinTech in it. And there's a huge issue with reskilling. And the reason the FinTech lab exists is to help with this gap. Uh, 1.2 million need reskilling, uh, according to the government estimates. And, then, and if you go on LinkedIn, there's 30,000 open jobs in IT, and that number has continued to grow. It was 11,000 back in 2020 early, and it's more than uh, almost triple that now. And the FinTech Lab is about being a thought leadership hub, provides innovation support and education, hands-on education. We like to be able to touch and feel. So come on by to the School of Computing at some point. Now let's get into the metaverse. What's it about? First, I have to give a disclaimer. Everything here is for informational purposes. You shouldn't construe any of this as legal investment advice or any other advice. And so make sure that uh, you take your own responsibility, go and ask for the right legal or tax advice if you do get involved in these things, uh, be risk assured. And also I like to say that people that invest, consider investing into to, uh, crypto should consider that they may lose all of their investment. So just take that into account. Also, there may be some software that we show you. You're fully responsible for any things that happen on your computer. Make sure your computer's up to date. And uh, that's, those are the key things there. So what's happening in terms of the uh, metaverse and more? Well, things are moving. Uh, Steam, which some of you may know, a gaming platform, they have about 25,000 people online daily and moving content and uh, ownership of the various products or sources 
in the Quest and Rift and Waveport, which are the augmented and virtual reality systems. There's a great virtual K-pop group that has 3 million listeners monthly on Spotify, and they're based on League of Legends. That's amazing to me. And then top five virtual reality VTubers, not just YouTubers anymore, VTubers, right? Made five plus million last year. Uh, and so whole alive productions behind that. So there's a reason for us to take a look at this. Uh, things are happening and more. But we're also on Zoom today. And I want to share with you a few different types of uh, the metaverses that exist. And so Gather Town is one that we've been looking at carefully. In Zoom, you know, we are all in a room. We can't really see each other. I don't see you for sure. There's a new uh, metaverse called Gather Town where you have your avatar, but at the same time, you also have your own video. So a lot of the various metaverses, you have to, when someone tells a joke, you have to go and click, oh, smile or laugh. It is very disconnected. Whereas here, if you tell a joke, you're gonna see the Zoom session combined with you walking around talking to people. Let's take a quick look at what this is about here and how it can be used as well. So let me just reshare here to make sure it's optimized. And here we are. We'll just take a quick look at Gather Town here. And so what it shows is that as you walk into an office on Gather Town, then you can share presentations as well, talk with people. And as you walk away from the office, other people's video disappears. You see your own video. And let's say that you, you can have various interactive sessions, various interactive areas. You can play card games. You can enjoy uh, riding on a scooter or buggy or what have you. Or you can also have like a all hands meeting. So now this is the town hall. And once you stand on the stage, everyone that's in the area hears you talking. So you get this sense of community because they can hear you talking. But if they were to walk next to somebody, they could have an individual one to one conversation as well. We can't do that. And that's one of the things that Zoom and other platforms has missed out on, right? So we have an opportunity to see more interaction with these type of platforms. Everyone has heard about Decentraland. And so, well, what is this about? And we decided to visit Tokiland, uh, to which is a little game area inside the Decentraland place. And this is what Decentraland looks like. And we'll take a look at what it's like to go through Tokiland here. So you're able to very, it's a, Big environment, it's more 3D than what you saw in Gather Town. These are a couple of people from the lab. We all talked together here and then we decided, okay, are we gonna go on this adventure together? Yeah, we will. And so ultimately we went ahead on to the actual adventure and met some other folks here as well. Then went on to the rabbit to see if we could get that gate open and play, continue to play the game. So that in itself was a little bit of a challenge. Those gold coins were behind there. Getty helped to get the gate open and then we were able to play the game together. Now Meta Mall is yet another way to look at this and to kind of let malls and retailers experiment with their product with, and also let you as users engage and try out new products as well. So in the Meta Mall, this is where, you know, it's like a retail shop. And in fact, uh, in Dubai, they're planning to open up one of these virtual reality retail shops here as well. You can go and look around at the products. It looks just like the store, of course. And if you go closer to a particular product, you're actually able to interact with it as well as you go through. And it's very much, again, like, a, like as if you're playing a video game the standard old uh, keys are there. And then if you look at a particular computer, this is a computer, you can see how it works. And if you go look at the washer or dryer, you can interact with it as well. If you want to uh, ask someone in the mall, hey, can I get some help? They will go and tell you about it uh, and tell you about the price. You can even negotiate with them. So all that interaction that we expect is there. And then you wanna go to someplace else, no more walking. Go ahead and get that jet pack on as well. So what I've shown you is different ways that we interact and different products that are out there. IKEA 
for example, has augmented reality for furniture placement. We're on Zoom here, so we're getting that real-time conversation, but it's very realistic. You can see my face, but we aren't really in a game or, or we can't go off and do a mission together as well. So that's where Roblox comes in. I'm sure some of you are have kids that have been playing around in Roblox. And so we went into Roblox as well. Roblox is uh, highly utilized by teenagers and, and uh, kids that are also between five and uh, up to their late teenage years. Um, but it's a great place to start into this virtual reality, this second life type of activity. And here we are, you can pop in a car, you can go around with friends uh, as well. They can just, it's so interactive, it's so free and it's free, you don't have to pay anything. A lot of those other platforms I've shown you, just in, you have to pay to play uh, just in order to get started. And so being able to try these things out are, are great, but this next generation coming up is gonna expect that capability. We shouldn't just be consuming these things though. We should be teaching our kids how to create them as well. So Roblox Create Decentraland has a creator studio uh, each one lets you create user-generated content. And so us, our students, our kids should be learning this because they're going to be creating the great next game. And so in Roblox Create, it's a lot like using a 3D system and just plug and play. This is my little house and car that I created in just a couple minutes. Of course, virtual reality doesn't just go with games and what have you. We can actually use it to really show us how furniture might show up in our home. And so here we are, you, you can see that chair and add it into your kitchen and see how it would look, move it around, see how it matches the color and so forth with the augmented reality capability. And this has delivered some business benefits. First of all, from an ESG perspective, you don't have to travel to the store and yet you can try out the different furniture and what have you, so it's more green. In fact, one st a stroller sales company in the UK got 33% uplift in their online sales because of the 3D model where the, the person could interact, open and close the stroller and so forth. More time on the website is brought and decrease in store returns. The, the person who goes on e-commerce and sees just that flat picture don't really know what they're getting. Sometimes we say, hey, I thought it was bigger than this, right? And so then by interacting with it virtually, you can actually see a better view. There's different opinions about this. The US is at 42% in terms of positive real interest in, in virtual reality. China's far and away the highest at 78% in terms of interest. Brazil is up there too, as well as Peru. Interesting. So don't sleep on the rest of the world if you're thinking about opening businesses in this area. In particular in China, Shirang has a demo here of metaverse assembly. How can we pull things together? You can create a car, you can create a various uh, capabilities in that and use it for education. And metaverse and education is interesting, right? You're bringing students together, they're interacting maybe from across China, across the world, and getting to know each other in a deeper way. You can also have a virtual office where you have a digital twin, you can try out your office, or you can bring your customers in and interact with them deeper. What are the business models behind this? Well, for a business itself, if you place your business on the metaverse, the key thing you should be thinking about is data to anticipate the customer's need. How do I get that community together and get more lo longer lifetime value? How can my customers try things out virtually? So you need to have a strategy. And if you're not trying to answer data-driven uh, questions now, then you're gonna fall even further behind in this model. How do the metaverses make money? They're gonna be selling answers to marketers' questions. Who will buy my product next? Who's interested? And that's why Facebook said, you know what, I, I read the writing on the wall about Facebook and social media. My demo is getting older and older. We need to attract a new generation. So they went all in and said, we're going to be meta. This is the next generation here. Of course, there's other ways to make money from selling land and, and economy management like banking. So a couple key business models, selling NFTs, you'll hear more about Commissions, get, you know, the mall, for example, has a 3% commission on whatever shirts or things that you sell uh, versus Apple's, you know, Apple stores, 50% commission for Apple store providers, which is why uh, there was some recent controversy about that. 
and of course, selling and leasing space. So investors, you could consider going in buying space early. A marketplace looks like this, very much like e-commerce uh, that you can buy shoes. So for those of you who are designing space, this is a whole new world of jobs for you, as well as for architects. They're selling land from $5,000 to $80,000 per plot. So uh, breathtaking numbers. And these are recent numbers, right? These are yesterday numbers. Even though the crypto market is down, these are the, still the breathtaking prices that are out there. It uh, doesn't mean that someone's paying them, though. And so Meta Mall, for example, also, if you want to buy a small store space, $225. That's a lot cheaper than buying a small store, of course, in Vivo City. But and you can play around with it. You want to have a large space, you can go in and uh, pay a quite a bit more. There is a risk. You buy this land, you buy the shoes, you buy whatever. And because you've bought it in the metaverse, there's a different type of asset pricing. It's not in Singapore dollars. It's in whatever uh, cryptocurrency because you need some digital currency for these things to happen. And here's uh, Decentraland's currency from $2.50 down to 80 cents now. So people that went into that early are crying. The chart of data. So this is the interesting part about the physical mall. Physical malls could have for a, more than a decade now could have been collecting this data. The footfall heat maps, where do people go? What do they look at? Which counter do they look at? In the 2000s, we were talking about this and doing it over in New York. But Metaverse Mall gives you this plus. So if a mall wasn't already doing this, how are they going to hop in here? Well, it's time to experiment and try things out. Not only is it these additional points, time zone, geolocation, you get the real user information. But in addition, you get social network and funds that you may have available in the past. You don't have a loyalty card anymore. It's all automatic. It's global. These are things that uh, retailers have struggled with for years. Now there they have it. So lots of opportunities here. Don't just listen to me. Let's I've set the stage. Let's bring on Winston here to the stage here to share a bit more with you. So Winston, if you could get your camera on there, I can see you. And I had the pleasure of being with Winston on a, over at the uh, Singapore Expo a few weeks ago. Brilliant young man who was a founder and CEO of Finut. And he was studying for his A-levels while we were uh, 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 just about this, to do the panel. And that's awesome. And so he's an influencer. He has 20,000 followers. Um, really proud to be on the same panel with him. So Winston, you're, you're, you're setting the path forward for my kids. I, I said, went home and I said, you've got to be follow Winston's footsteps. <laughs> Go ahead, Winston, over to you. All right. Thanks so much, Prof Carter. All right. So let me share my slides. All right, so the metaverse. Um, so before that, let me just introduce a, a bit of myself. I'm Winston, I'm the founder and CEO of Finute. And Finute is a metaverse technology company that develops immersive virtual experiences. And we have brought NMCs, uh, government agencies, and NGOs into the metaverse. And I'm also a micro influencer on social media where I share mostly about the metaverse, gaming, and entrepreneurship. A fun fact is that I'm still studying right now. I'm taking the A-levels at Millennium Institute. I'm a field tree student. And I actually created the first ever metaverse in a school in Singapore. So if you want, you can check out my school in, in, in the virtual space. And I've been creating 3D virtual work since I was 10 years old. And yeah, and, and, it's, and it's been a quite a journey since. So what is the metaverse? Well, um, if you know what's the metaverse, you type it out in the chat. Or, or what. if not, uh, I'll just say it right now. So the metaverse, according to Wikipedia, is a hypothetical iteration of the internet as a single universal and immersive virtual world facilitated by VR and AR. But in a colloquial term, it's just used to describe a network of virtual worlds that focuses largely on social connection. So what are some of the metaverses that you have known or heard of? If you know any, you can type it out in the chat. If not, yeah. All right, so I'll just move on. So here are some of the metaverses that you might have heard or know of, which is one of them is Roblox, as uh, Prof Carter mentioned just now. Uh, Minecraft, where you can actually build your own worlds. A uh, VR chat is actually quite a big um, metaverse where you can actually use VR headsets to actually talk and interact with other people. And also um, Second Life. Second Life is a unique case as it is actually the first 
or OG Metaverse from 2004, which actually shows that the Metaverse concept is not new and it has been in existence for a very long time. And I myself, I grew up in the Metaverse. I grew up on Roblox. So it's definitely not a new concept for us young, young, for the younger generation. And it's been here for a very, very long time. And this is actually what we call a centralized metaverse. So Roblox, Minecraft, VRChat, and uh, Second Life, these are all what we call centralized metaverse. And whereas the ones that are more popular right now that you might have heard of would be Decentraland and Sandbox. And these are what we call decentralized metaverse. So centralized metaverse and decentralized metaverse. So you might be wondering, what is the main difference between these two types of metaverses? Well, for starters, a decentralized metaverse is generally an open source platform where the community has the freedom to control everything. And the control actually lies in the community where users actually govern the control. So um, just, just, just a quick fun fact, Decentraland is actually governed by a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization which actually allows community control over the metaverse. So basically, users actually control this metaverse, they govern how it runs, and, and you know, they govern how it works. And a lot of these individuals have control over their own assets through their own uh, metaverse, uh, uh, through their own uh, digital wallets, where they can actually buy and sell as per their wishes. And the term decentralized actually just means that it's not controlled or owned by any single entity, and instead, it's controlled by millions and millions of computers linked together, known as the blockchain. And this is an advantage where it is quite hard to censor or shut it down, as there's millions of computers around the world linked together to form a decentralized metaverse. And in a decentralized metaverse, which uses the blockchain, transactions are done using cryptocurrencies or NFTs. And you can actually own these virtual items in your own blockchain wallet. So you can actually like buy virtual clothing like NFTs to wear on your avatar, buy virtual clothes, and also buy virtual land. So these are some of the stuff that you can buy, and these are actually screenshots from OpenSea. So if you are interested in getting NFTs, you can actually check them out. And decentralized metaverse, the prices of items can actually be affected by the different market conditions, where if the value of a cryptocurrency drops, the prices of the item will also drop as it's tied to the cryptocurrency. This was mentioned by Prof. Carter just now. And whereas, on the other hand, in a centralized metaverse, um, there's actually only one single entity governing the entire network. And usually it's the companies that own and operate these metaverses. So for example, you see in the pictures at the bottom left and right, um, Microsoft actually owns Minecraft, which gives them the total final control over the metaverse. Whereas for Fortnite, um, Epic Games actually owns Fortnite and they have the single last uh, final say on what happens in the metaverse. So for centralized metaverse, as the word centralized suggests, they are largely centralized and governed from a single entity. And in centralized environment like Fortnite and Roblox, the virtual community actually lives within a centrally controlled space and they're limited by the, per by the parameters set by the organization. So um, there will be like privacy policies in terms of services where you have to adhere to. And the community can also interact and interact and share experiences together, which is the same as like a decentralized metaverse. And, but the, the, but the difference is largely that you can actually control, actually own the pieces of digital environment as they are more centralized and they're actually owned by the companies. So let me just dive into this deeper. So in a centralized metaverse, uh, most items are actually purchased with fiat currency as opposed to cryptocurrencies on decentralized metaverses. And they're largely stored on the servers of the centralized organization or company. So for example, on Roblox, you can actually purchase virtual items with Robux. And as you can see, the, the item here costs $3,000. So you can actually buy this item and then you will own it. Whereas in Fortnite, you can actually purchase virtual items or a virtual avatar through a currency known as V-Bucks and you can buy different items uh, which, which you can wear an avatar. But one thing to note is that for centralized um, metaverses, the virtual currencies are not interchangeable. Meaning that if you have, if you have v bucks, you cannot just bring it over to Roblox or your Robux or Roblox can bring it over to Fortnite, as they're all centralized, closed off ecosystems and they don't interact with each other, which is why it's a centralized metaverse with not much um, room for um, interoper interoperability. Okay, moving on. 
And furthermore, in a centralized metaverse, and for example, if you get banned, all your currency and virtual items will actually be inaccessible. So for example, um, if you'll be banned on Minecraft, you cannot access any other metaverses like the other uh, Minecraft worlds. And for example, the right screenshot is actually on Roblox, where if you get terminated, you can no longer access the metaverse. As compared to a decentralized metaverse where you can just create a new wallet and you can actually just join in the decentralized metaverse. So for a centralized metaverse, the control is largely more tighter and more and more people, uh, they have restricted freedoms as compared to a decentralized metaverse, which is largely more decentralized and users have more control and the community have more control as compared to a centralized uh, metaverse where everything is mostly uh, governed and controlled by the company. So let's talk about some of the use cases of the metaverse and how different companies have been using them. So for starters, I think this was quite a big thing uh, at the start of this year, which is the JP Morgan Virtual Lounge. So in this JP Morgan Virtual Lounge, uh, people can actually talk and interact with other users virtually. So as you can see from the different screenshots, um, this is actually uh, the, the head of JP Morgan and he will greet you at the start of the lounge. And there's a tiger which roams around. So um, as you can see, the metaverse is all about um, imagine, imagination as you can put anything you want, whatever you want, as compared to in the real world. And, and in, this, in this virtual um, environment, you're able to talk to other users as seen here. You talk to other users and also you can be part of this uh, uh, ex chat experience with many other people, which largely shows a social interaction and social uh, um, environment for people to connect and interact with. Moving on, on Roblox, there's something called a Hyundai Mobility Adventure and it's set up by Hyundai, the car company. And in this metaverse experience created by Hyundai, um, people will be able to actually experience like the different uh, offerings that Hyundai has, where you can actually, you know, test drive some of their latest models. Like you can see here is the Ionic 5, the latest model by Hyundai. And you'll be able to learn more about its uh, environmentally friendly uh, features and also how Hyundai uh, uh, contributes to its uh, environment and sustainability goals through their virtual metaverse experience. And this is one of an experiential use case where people can actually drive a Hyundai um, car in the metaverse. And who knows if they're interested one day, they can just buy a Hyundai car in the real world. So it's actually a experiential metaverse, which allows um, consumers to actually explore more about the brands and the products that the brand offers. And moving on, um, for a branding use case, Gucci is also on Roblox. And there was a very, very big article, I think last year, where a virtual Gucci bag actually sold more than the actual bag. So this bag actually sold for about 4,000 US dollars, where a typical Gucci bag costs about 900 to 1,000 dollars. So this is largely used for branding uh, by Gucci on Roblox, where you can actually try on and purchase this virtual Gucci clothing and you can actually wear it on your virtual avatar. So this actually helps to instill um, the branding characteristics and also help people remember that Gucci is a brand that, that, that tries and experiments new things like going to the metaverse. And this is something that many other brands are also doing. So not just Gucci, but uh, from the top of my head, um, there's many other uh, fashion brands that are doing this. And uh, they are all entering the metaverse by having virtual clothing and virtual fashion items for people to wear and have. Moving on, there's also an educational use case uh, for, for the metaverse as well. And actually, we developed a metaverse app, which actually helps people uh, learn more about financial literacy through financial planning and also helps uh, young, younger adults in making better financial decisions. So it's a gamified virtual world where people can actually like, you know, spend money um, spend money, uh, save, uh, invest, and so much more. You can do it in a controlled environment, which actually helps prepare people better for, for, for their real work. By having a virtual world, you can actually just treat it as a sandbox and just try and fail in the, in the virtual world. And one day when you go into society, you know that these are the mistakes that you have made and you'll be able to um, you know, uh, correct yourself in the real world. So this is what we call a financial literacy uh, metaverse world where you can actually explore and experiment and fail without any uh, effects of the real world. Moving on, um, this is actually a social use case that we have created also. It's a Singapore metaverse. Um, there's a video, so let me actually just play the video quickly. All 
All right. So as you've seen just now, that was our metaverse, our Singaporean metaverse. And this metaverse can actually socialize with other people and also make friends. And it's not just about making friends. If you saw from the video just now, there's actually like different buses and different cars. And those are stuff that you can either purchase or even earn. So for example, if you're a bus driver in that metaverse, you can actually, you know, earn money. You can earn money to use it to like buy cars, buy houses, etc. So it's meant to be a virtual experience where you can actually socialize, interact with different friends. And this is something that is quite used widely by uh, many, many companies, which is a socialized um, world where people can actually interact. And that's where brands come in as well, where they can actually advertise their, 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 their virtual offerings in the, in the metaverse. And next, uh, this is another use case that has actually, has actually been, 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 been used last year. So um, we actually organized virtual NDP last year. And as you recall last year, um, back in 2021, if you recall due to the COVID pandemic, the NDP was actually postponed. The actual NDP wasn't actually held on the 9th of August which is why we came up with a virtual solution where we actually celebrate National Day in the virtual space. And it actually became the number one app on the App Store for both role-playing and simulation categories. And this shows that actually the metaverse is not just a concept. It actually can be put into real use cases, such as true like real life events, and it actually can be used. So the metaverse is not that, it's definitely not something that is not proven yet, it is proven. And there are many use cases to back it up. And uh, I would love to share that we're also uh, doing a metaverse this year for NDP, but I can't share any details with you, but do look out in the, in the coming months. Yeah. I think I've come to the end of my presentation. Yeah. Um, if you have any question or feedback, can you just you know, scan a QR code and just reach out to me? I'll be happy to uh, uh, help you and if not yes uh, have any uh, Q&A segment in the in the chat and I'll answer it uh, as much as I can Thank, thanks thank you so much for listening to my presentation thanks a lot Winston some great key points there uh, and I love that you helped to create that virtual national day parade that's fantastic right so if we can see what it means to be a creator we all benefit from that let's make sure that uh, we tell other people, hey, go out there and create. There's an opportunity for you to do it and it can be really useful. Now we're gonna turn over to Justin, who's coming in from Rajan Tan. So Justin came and spoke last time with us and shared about the risks and opportunities that are inside of uh, participating in the metaverse. What is it gonna be? How, does, how can we make sure that legally we're ready and there are new legal questions to be addressed. And so uh, he's going to be sharing with us about these complex IT issues and multi-jurisdictional data protection works that he's done. Justin, over to you. All right, thanks, Malachi. Um, so, you know, as, as, as was stated in the agenda, my part of the presentation is about the legal aspects of the, of the metaverse and NFTs. Um, but actually, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the crypto and NFT side of things today. Um, in the first session in March, I did cover uh, various legal questions that arise up from the metaverse, you know, based on your interventions with other people in the metaverse, uh, what laws should apply, for example, if you punch somebody in the metaverse. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go over that again today, but instead I'm going to focus a little bit more on um, things that have been happening recently. Um, and I think if you're involving the news, a lot of the activity in recent times has come in the crypto space, especially. Um, so before I get into to, to what's happened and, and the implications of that, um, I just want to show a slide that, that uh, I showed in the first presentation, in which I kind of argued that, that the law does have an important role to play within the metaverse, uh, particularly in the crypto space um, and blockchain space. Uh, and the reasons for this is, is it was for a number of factors, um, particularly the, 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 the lack of sufficient development in the technology that underlies the blockchain and, and, and crypto space, the fact that some centralized rules are still needed to govern interactions and transactions between individuals in order for the system to function properly and not fall apart. And finally, the fact that the core tenets of decentralization and anonymity uh, fundamentally at odds with the need for this set of mutually accepted rules because if you if you if you if if your core premise of the, the metaverse or of the uh, blockchain um, 
and the, and the distinction on this was drawn by Winston, you know, the, the centralized metaverses and decentralized ones. But if you accept that the, the basic premise uh, as it was first conceptualized is, is one which, which was decentralized and where, where users are anonymous to each other, um, fundamentally these tenets are at odds with the need for rules that govern interactions between such users and the ability to enforce such rules against the individual users. So with, with those sort of principles in mind, um, I just like to, to highlight a few things that happened recently in the, in the crypto space. Um, this, this, this was big news, so I'm sure most of you are aware, but important things to highlight will include the implosion of the Terra blockchain and Luna stablecoin. So, so that was a really popular uh, cryptocurrency coin um, that was very widely traded, had a lot of value in it, but within a space of a week or, uh, or so, uh, the value almost went to zero. And as part of that fallout, 3AC, 3 Arrows Capital, uh, a major crypto fund, uh, completely collapsed as well due to the losses suffered uh, in the Terra Luna uh, implosion. And also slightly earlier, a few weeks ago, Axie Infinity, the, the biggest and most popular uh, game fi or play to earn game uh, in the crypto space, suffered the biggest ever crypto hack uh, worth uh, 620 million USD. So I just want to highlight some key lessons that, that uh, were raised as a result of uh, you know, these events. First is that the systems remain ultimately highly vulnerable to exploitation. And this is exploitation in a number of ways. I think, I think the most prominent way that we, we, when you think of the term exploitation, uh, exploitation, sorry, it's hacking. Um, and this is what happened in the, in the case of X Infinity. Um, crypto systems, blockchain systems, even though they claim to be immutable, they claim to be unchangeable, ultimately, uh, the security, the, the, the core premise of security is sort of undercut by the fact that hackers can still get into your wallets, can still uh, extract your digital assets from your crypto wallet and, and uh, steal them for, for their own use. Um, the other kind of exploitation is, is, is technically not illegal, but it's arbitrage, whereby there's a flaw in the system or some kind of uh, design issue with the system whereby uh, the users and individuals are able to exploit it to, to gain profits for themselves. But it was this um, arbitrage attack that was a core factor that led to the implosion of the, the Terra blockchain and Luna stablecoin. Uh, so it is clear then, therefore, that further advancements in system technology and design are needed to counter or to protect or reduce the risks of exploitation here. Next is, um, I think as, as Prof Keith mentioned at the start, crypto markets, NFT markets, they're all highly volatile. If, if you just look at the, the way the, the, the values fluctuate, I think it's quite self-evident. And a big part of why these markets are so volatile is because of the fact that there's a lot of over-leveraging going on there. And over-leveraging happens and it's possible because of the lack of systemic and regulatory safeguards that exist, uh, whether from a legal standpoint in terms of regulations passed and, 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 and applicable to these uh, markets or, or safeguards that are built into the system themselves by the, the owners or the designers of this system. Um, these kinds of safeguards are very common in your typical financial markets, your stock markets, your equity markets. Um, and it is the lack of these that make the crypto markets a lot more volatile than what you would typically see. And I think it, based, on, based on what's happened, I think it's, it's clear that the term stable coin uh, as much as it claims to be stable because of the fact that it's pegged to um, something, you know, whether it's the US dollar or in the case of, of, of Terra, another kind of uh, uh, coin, un or another kind of underlying coin, um, they are not actually that stable. Um, and they are, still they, they are still similarly susceptible to the same volatility that other kinds of cryptocurrency are subject to. Uh, and ultimately, this kind of highlights what I mentioned in the previous presentation, the, the, the earlier slide, that there is a demonstrable need for centralized rules and safeguards. The, the rules that the players of the game agree to play by, um, that ensure that the game itself is fair, is not it, it, it is reasonably uh, uh, um, protected in terms of you know, the, the, the players who are playing within the game. Uh, specifically to, to, to the XC Infinity point, um, the, the, what has happened since the hack has raised a lot of questions about the feasibility of the play to earn gaming model. Um, if you're familiar with Axie, 
it's the, 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 the model there is as you play the game, um, you earn uh, cryptocurrency, the, the, the underlying coin that, that, that is within the XC ecosystem. And it's really based on who can put in more time and effort into the game uh, and, and, and in order to earn the most money. And actually, there was, a, there was an interview done by, by some news, news, news uh, uh, publications recently whereby uh, they interview people who, who have tried to convert their, their careers into, into uh, players of these play-to-earn games, whereby they try to earn a living simply by playing these games. And I think the, 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 the fact that, that there was this hack that, that, and the fact that, that cryptocurrency markets are so volatile uh, kind of highlights the, the, the lack of feasibility of this kind of career but also the model, the gaming model itself, um, it is probably unsustainable to have a pure play to earn game if the game itself is not inherently fun to play. Because if you think about it, essentially the, 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 the amount of coins will just continue to increase based on people playing it more and more. But there's no actually, there's no actual underlying value that, 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 that is associated with these coins. So um, ultimately the entire ecosystem is, is just purely inflated. So I think that calls the question, um, you know whether the gaming, whether the game fire industry needs to pivot to something that whereby the 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 core premise of the game is not to earn money, but rather to play a game to have fun. Um, money is an incidental part of it, or cryptocurrency earning is an incidental part of it. But the underlying premise of the game has to be fun in order to retain uh, the user base of the game itself. And finally, questions are are, are raised, you know, about the long term future of crypto. Um, I, I, I know that all this kind of sounds really negative, but I guess maybe there's the occupational hazard of being a lawyer. Um, and, I, and I don't mean for it to come across that way, but it, it's more, what I'm trying to do is really more to highlight uh, and, and make sure that, that people are aware of the, the, the risks involved uh, and, and the legal issues involved um, when dealing with this kind of issues. So in terms of the long-term future of crypto, and if the, the, the state of technology doesn't evolve sufficiently quickly, um, there, is a, there is a significant question as to whether blockchain systems can really work in a purely decentralized manner without state intervention to set the rules needed uh, to level the playing field. And on that note, uh, I just want to highlight that, that, that there have been a quite a number of significant legal developments in Singapore and in other legal jurisdictions such as the UK um, that do address these issues whereby Individuals who have suffered harm, who have suffered loss as a result of the exploitation of blockchain systems do have certain remedies that they can rely on or can potentially rely on uh, in the courts to, 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 to address the harms that they've suffered. So quite significantly, there has been a recent case uh, that, that was, that was uh, handled by, by my colleagues in my litigation department, whereby they successfully brought a case where the Singapore courts recognize that first, stolen digital assets can be the subject of a proprietary injunction, meaning that if your, if your digital assets have been stolen, the courts can uh, issue an injunction against the, um, the, the exchange itself, the crypto exchange, to injunct the stolen assets from being traded further so that you know, they, they, they don't disappear into, um, by, by, by virtue of being tra traded indefinitely into, into, into uh, any number of wallets whereby you can't trace it anymore. And, and secondly, and probably more significantly, the Singapore courts are willing to grant such interim orders and injunctions against persons whose identities are known. So I think this brings me back to the earlier point that I mentioned, whereby uh, a core tenet of the idea of blockchain and cryptocurrency is the fact that the users can be anonymous if they want to be. And um, the courts have, have accepted that and, and have approached that, that issue head on by accepting that they are willing and they do have the power to issue injunctions and other interim orders against persons, specific users whose identities may not be known, but whose sort of wallet addresses are known and, and they're identified by that by their particular user ID or wallet ID. Um, the UK courts have adopted a similar approach by similarly recognizing NFTs as legal property and as well as the same ability to issue such injunctions against, against persons unknown. So I think it's quite clear that, that um, from the um, from the Perspectives of the courts, um, the they have been willing to approach these these novel legal issues in a very direct way, and they are they are catching up as fast as they can, or trying to 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 keep up with with, with the evolving nature of this of such of such technologies to ensure that the court process continues to provide sufficient safeguards to to, to individuals seeking redress, uh, seeking legal remedy. 
Um, the fundamental question that, that, that will be raised, of course, will be um, the question of legal jurisdiction. And I think this is relevant both to NFTs as well as the metaverse. And it's an important question as to if you if, if you have suffered harm, if you have suffered harm, where can you sue? Where can you bring your, your, your litigation? Uh, can you do it in your home country? Must you go to a different country to do so? And what has been seen from the case law here is that legal jurisdiction can be quite uh, clearly established uh, either via the location of the digital asset owner. So for example, if, if, I, if I'm the owner of the asset, I'm in Singapore, um, it is quite likely that I can argue that the case should be heard in the Singapore courts. Um, secondly, if the, the, the location of the asset exchange will also be relevant. So there was, there, there was a case for the, the, the Singapore uh, case that I mentioned earlier, um, whereby because the, the, the asset exchange uh, was incorporated in Singapore, the appropriate forum was argued and was accepted by the courts that uh, it should be in Singapore because of the location of the exchange. Um, and I think, so, so that's on, that, aside from what the courts are doing, I think it's also relevant to note that on the regulatory side, in the court for, for, for governments, um, there has been active effort to explore how to effectively regulate digital assets in the metaverse. Um, different countries have tried different ways of doing so, but, but uh, all the different laws that have been passed so far have still been quite tentative, I must say. Um, the only sort of comprehensive digital asset law that's been passed is, has been uh, in Dubai. Uh, but even that takes a very uh, conservative approach towards, towards uh, regulating such digital assets. Uh, they really treat it as sort of an extension of a financial asset. Um, so I think in Singapore especially, I think we know, we are, we are aware that the regulator has been uh, seeking feedback from, from, from different industry players, from, from law firms, from uh, people in the crypto space to, to gain feedback as to what is the most appropriate way, what are the different pain points it, 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 that, that, that companies face um, in order to more effectively regulate digital assets in the metaverse. So for the next part of my presentation, just very quickly, um, I'd like to touch on the, the, the second part, which is tokenization beyond the concept of NFTs. And by NFTs here, I'm referring specifically to digital artwork NFTs. Um, when you hear the term NFTs, this is what really most 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 commonly comes to mind uh, is the, you know, uh, your, your bought it's NFT uh, and, and, and things along those lines, crypto kitties, uh, whereby and the NFT itself is also, is associated with a specific digital artwork. And the artwork is stored in a specified URL, and the token itself is tied and, re and references that URL. Uh, the, the important thing to note about these kind of digital artwork NFTs is that the IP rights in the digital artwork itself don't typically pass with the NFT. So when you own the NFT for this digital artwork, you don't actually own, or you, you, most, you typically don't actually own uh, the IP rights in the digital artwork itself. So you don't actually have the ability to, to deal with or exploit um, the specific digital artwork that, that you're so-called buying. And I think because of that, it's quite important to note that um, in order for NFTs to have a non-speculative value, um, it does need to be tied to some underlying benefits like, whereby the NFT can be used for a certain purpose, has certain benefits conferred on it beyond the digital artwork itself. Otherwise, the value is purely speculative based on oh, how popular is this artwork or how many people are, are into this particular uh, uh, NFT uh, at, at, this, at, at a given time. And, and, and it is purely that kind of market sentiment that defines the value. Um, beyond that, I think it, it's, it's quite, I think, I think it's quite interesting to, 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 to talk, to think about how else tokens are being used or can be used. Um, and some examples are, are, are what I put on the slide here. Lah. So first example would be physical asset tokens. Um, this is quite interesting because instead of a digital artwork, the token is tied to a physical asset. So it's a means of trading goods, lah, essentially. Uh, if I buy the token, I'm, I, I'm, I'm essentially buying the underlying good. And, and the tokenization model is really a means of facilitating the sale of that good. So you think, for example, like um, you know, like your, your carousel marketplace, right? Um, a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty in the transaction because it, it, it's really uh, tied in good faith to, to, to whether the buyer is, is, is trying to play you out or, or if the seller will actually send you the good after you transfer the money. And the tokenization model is, is, is helpful here because it steps in to, to provide the comfort to both sides. Um, because of the fact that the token is on the chain and, 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 and it cannot be altered by either party, um, the, 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 both the buyer and the seller are confident that, that when the token is transacted and the funds are held by the, the blockchain itself, um, the, the, the 
buyer won't be able to access the money until the seller has uh, received the token. And all of this is verifiable and provable on the blockchain itself. So it's arguable that this could potentially be the future of e-commerce whereby uh, all e-commerce trades will take place um, on the blockchain. Um, another example would be tokens and extensions of existing business use cases. Um, and this, an example of this can be seen in event ticketing um, whereby, but I, think, I think this is happening in the NBA, uh, whereby they sell event tickets uh, using NFTs or tokens. Um, and this is, this, this is done in order to avoid scalping or gray market hoarding, like, whereby uh, people just, uh, when, when tickets are released, they just buy them up and then they, they resell them for, for inflated prices. I think, I think if, if you ever try to attend any kind of popular concert in Singapore, I'm sure you've experienced this kind of uh, inflationary market. Like. So the, the, the idea of an NFT is meant to avoid this because the identity of the buyer is, is recorded within the NFT and it's not possible to resell the, 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 the token uh, to another different buyer without, uh, because you're not able to alter the, the, the store identity of the buyer on the chain itself. Um, and these NFTs typically also provide other benefits such as goodie bags or VIP access uh, as a sort of sweetener. Uh, and, 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 and this tied to what I mentioned earlier about the NFT having some underlying value. Uh, so beyond the ticket itself, the NFT can be tied to other kind of benefits that are being provided by the organizers such as goodie bags or VIP access. And finally, I want to touch on utility and governance tokens. I think, I think this is sort of more interesting because it's, a, it's the biggest departure from the concept of the NFT as a asset itself. Um, utility or governance tokens are, are not strictly speaking tradable assets, but, but rather they are tokens that are assigned the right to do certain things within a specific ecosystem. So typically what happens is that um, governance tokens can be used to, to perform certain administrative tasks or um, to, 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 to use to, uh, or, or be used to vote on certain uh, uh, um, measures that are being taken. So um, the people who have more governance tokens will have greater say over what happens, they have greater voting power. Uh, so this is interesting because it really enables the democratization of communities uh, within the metaverse, uh, whereby you, don't, you, you, you require less and less of a centralized body to manage these communities. And I think this is the core concept of, the, of, a, of a DAO or DAO, um, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, whereby once you set the initial rules um, for the utility and governance tokens, you don't need to, to continue, continue to, to, to actively manage how, these are, how, how, how the community works, but rather the, the, the governance tokens will be used uh, in terms of guiding the direction of the community, setting the rules of the community, and basically enabling the community to run itself. Um, and I think one the, the most probably likely prominent use case of this would be in gaming. Um, and I think this is probably interesting um, if, if, and I think this is something that game developers are, are increasingly looking at, um, whereby gaming, game developers can utilize the concept of governance tokens to allow users to play the most and are therefore most invested in the game and can earn the most governance tokens to influence the, great, the, the direction of the game development. Because... Um, when, when you want to seek feedback from your user base, you want the people who are the most invested in the game to have the most say, right? Because they are the ones who, 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 have, who are most invested in the game, who, have, who, who, who really know the game inside out and who are most impacted by any kind of decisions that are made by the developer. So I think this is where the, the concept of utility and governance tokens can come in a very interesting way. Right, so yeah, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, happy to take any kind of questions you have on, on, on the different legal regulatory aspects of the metaverse. Uh, so yeah, just shoot it back in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Justin. That was really great. The aspect of governance token, interesting, how we can work together and understand how what different decisions can be made. I like the lawsuit location. That provides a very interesting perspective, right? Uh, because it'll, if the court decides to choose that they can rule on it, it also gives the court and the whole legal system experience on ruling on it. And so it be, can become like a virtuous cycle. Well, they know, the judges there know what they're talking about. So let's have more cases there. So some very positive outcomes from that. And I like that your start. Being anonymous, kind of like defeats the legal protections because then how are you legally connected? So interesting walkthrough as always, Justin, thanks a lot for that.
we are now going to bring up uh, Broderick here. And so Broderick is the strategist at Bridges Studios and also a dear friend. He's launched uh, NFTs and has seen millions of dollars in sales even during the crypto winter. So uh, well done, Broderick, and thanks for continuing to open our minds here. He's also the founder of Mission MissionDAO, which is looking to make sure that people that are helping other people are able to continue helping other people even across borders, across jurisdictions, uh, even when sometimes the funds are drying up. So welcome, Roderick, again to this uh, second session with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Prof. Keith. Uh, and also thank you, Justin and uh, Winston for sharing a little bit. I'm, I'm not going to take too long. I'm going to try to keep it within 10 minutes uh, maximum. I, I want to answer the question very, very quickly today, um, which is, should I buy an NFT? Is NFT for me, All right? Because I think that's the question that people are asking. Like, should I buy an NFT? The market is down right now. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, uh, let me give you just a quick uh, market update. So should I buy an NFT? Here's a market update. Anyway, the market is really bearish, right? It's, it's a terrible time. It's a terrible time for NFT traders. It's a terrible time for NFT founders as well. Uh, people are just struggling to, you know, get stuff done. Why? Uh, because it's the bear market right now. Uh, people are not incentivized to trade something so speculative as an NFT. Um, we have seen a trading volume drop, you know, from an average of about $100 million to like $20 million now a day, every day. And uh, we, also, we have also seen Ethereum drop from an all-time high of 4500 all the way down to 1000 So a lot of us are down bad. Like, uh, but the thing is, the thing is, even with even with like 20% of people trading, uh, there are still like quite a decent amount of people buying stuff today and yesterday and the day before. And we have to answer the big question, right? Like why are people still buying NFT? And should you buy an NFT? Anyway, once again, not financial advice. Um, you would see most of them not financial advice, only at the very end, speculative, but do not take it as financial advice at all. Um, yeah, I want to answer a very, very quick question. Why are people buying NFT? Why are people interested in buying NFT? So I'm going to give you four reasons and they're just right here. Four reasons why people are buying NFTs. Number one, entertainment. They buy it because they like it. I'm going to go in and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it uh, when, when we get there. Utility, like what uh, Justin mentioned, uh, I'm buying it to enjoy the benefits of it. Right? So there are benefits to NFT. There are real world benefits to NFT. Uh, I buy it to signal, to social, to social signal, like, yo, I am such and such a person. I buy to associate to a brand very much like how we would buy brand goods uh, because we want to be associated with the brand. Like, for example, we buy Nike because we want to, you know, feel like we're an athlete. You know, we want to, we, we buy Nike because we want to feel like we are, you know, uh, in it. Or like we buy Reebok because we are part of the CrossFit cult, right? Or we buy Versace or, or Gucci because we are, we, we, what we like that. We want to be associated with that. So you buy an NFT to be associated with a brand. There is a sort of certain flex to it, right? And lastly, you buy uh, NFT for speculation. And I, I did a recent survey with some of my friends. I realized that most of them are doing it to make money, right? So that is kind of sad, right? Because it's so much more than making money. Like, yes, there is money to be made. Uh, there, also, there is also money to be lost. Like a lot of people lost a lot of money, myself included, uh, in the last few weeks, right? So let's dive into it. Uh, let me tell you why you should or should not buy an NFT, whether it should interest you or not. So entertainment, people buy NFT because they like it, right? In, in the same way, people buy art because they like it. So on, on the screen, you'll see uh, Marinda and, and uh, Fidenza, right? And these are like digital algorithmic created art by the company called Artblock. And people are buying this. They're buying it up. And there is no reason to buy it apart from the fact that I kind of like it. I like how it makes me feel. Yesterday, we have a big announcement and uh, we saw Pharrell William, who is the who is BBC, right? Uh, BBC, Billionaire Boy Club, right? Pharrell William, this rapper, uh, he just became the CBO, the chief brand officer of this brand called Doodle. And I love Pharrell, right? I love Human Made. I love uh, BBC Ice Cream, like that fashion brand. I'm, I'm all about that. So I suddenly became very interested in Doodle. Yeah, so that, that is something that is that is exciting, you know, uh, the people buy Doodle because they want to be associated with Pharrell, they want to be associated with the entire Doodle cult. And it's exciting because we know what's going to come up, right? Pharrell is going to likely do uh, BBC and Doodle merchandise, which I will absolutely buy, right? Because I just like the things that he made, right? So people buy things because they like it, 
right? So there, there is one reason why people buy NFT entertainment, but uh, I would say this is like 10%, maybe even 5% of the market. Uh, next is utility. People buy NFT for utility. Uh, they buy NFT because they, are, they get to be a part of a community. So right here, you see, uh, this is the Kaiju Kings community in Singapore. And uh, it is a legitimate community. There's 300 of them. Uh, recently, we went out for coffee. There was like 30 of us. And of course, there are other events where more people come. This is like a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And people just show up and they decide to like, hey, let's, let's drink coffee together. And uh, we just came together, we just have some time, laugh about the market, feel bad together about the market. And every morning, they would, they would send this thing. Every morning, they would text and they would say GM. And it says good, which means good morning. Right, so you're part of this community, and there's people that you know you banter with and you laugh with. And they're talking about the market and they're talking about random stuff. So people buy NFT to belong somewhere, which is one of the base human need, right? To stand out and to belong. So people buy NFT to belong to a community, and community does you know wonders. Uh, in-person event. This is something that is also happening uh, right now in New York. So there is a lot of activation right now. This is eight fest in New York. You, if you own a BAYC, a Bodded Yacht Club, or you own a Mutant Yacht Club, you get to go to the party. And it looks amazing. And you know, I'm in Singapore, I didn't get to go to the party. And that's one of the reasons why people buy NFT. So they can attend in-person event. This is another one. This is Doodle in New York. On the right, you see Doodle at South by Southwest. Um, and they have the chain smokers, you know, performing. So you get to go for amazing concert. Uh, and fun stuff like that in-person event there is going to be a few in Singapore as well so I have been to a few NFT events and they are fun right it, it, it is like a concert there are people that are vibing you're having drinks you're, you're meeting new people it is a fun thing like being a part of a community and having in-person event is one of the reasons why people are buying NFTs uh, people buy NFTs for merchandising as well so this is BBRC IV Boys. so amazing right people buy this so that they buy the NFTs so that they can get you know this really cool merchandise let me show you the exact merchandise it is a varsity jacket made with full leather and if you buy the nft you get the opportunity you just claim this for free you get a cool leather jacket you get a cool varsity jacket and it's amazing like people buy nft so they can get merchandises as well i i forgot to wear my nft t-shirts or hoodie but you know usually they have that as well this is adidas Adidas have into the metaverse and they have this hoodie that they, they, that they give out if you buy the NFT. Um, so yeah, really, really, really fun stuff. This is why people are buying NFT. There's also a storytelling aspect to it. This is Love Island, a little bit like, um, like a Netflix show, right? People are choosing like, hey, this is the character that we want on the Love Island. They're competing, it's like a modeling thing and then they will eventually create like an entire story plot about, you know, a bunch of Azuki going to a Love Island and then create an entire Netflix series out of it. Like, that is kind of like the idea. People want to be involved in a part of storytelling, very much like how people like to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? I, I, I enjoy that because I get to be a part of a story. And that's one of the reasons why people are buying NFT as well. So the utility part of it is huge. Um, there's also a social thing. So Co Museum, amazing, amazing project. Up and coming artists, it is done with the Freeport in Singapore. Um, amazing project as well. The, the, the whole vision of um, Co Museum is to democratize art. So basically, they are like all oh, these masterpieces stored in the vault. And the founder, he wanted, you know, he wanted this, this art pieces to not just stay in the vault in the crates. He wanted it out in the public. So it is, it is for public good, right? So this is another one. People buy, um, people buy NFTs. They buy this for really, really cool. Like, you know, they want to co-own a certain painting. I can't say too much because there's still some things that are hidden at this point. Uh, but... Yeah, they want to build a museum together. They want to democratize art together. It's imagine like having a, a basket up next to an X copy, like right? things that um, like art. Yeah, people like it because they, they're buying it for art, they're buying it for culture, they're buying it to democratize the fine art market, they're buying it to disrupt the fine art market, they, they're buying it to be a part of the fine art market. So this is the many utility that people enjoy when they buy NFT, and this is why they're still buying even the bear market. Uh, as mentioned, people buy to signal, like yo, I belong to this cool cow, right? I have this amount of money. I am rich. I am in the know. I am an OG. I have been around. Uh, people buy NFT to signal. People buy NFT to say that, hey, I, I made it or hey, I am this type of person. And uh, it's the same way as people wear Rolexes or Pate or AP because we do want to communicate, right? Hey, that I'm of a certain status, you know, deep down inside our heart, we know that. We can say, hey, we like the design and all that. But uh, there's also a certain aspect where we buy to signal, to tell the world that, hey, I'm a certain type of person. 
And this is one of the reasons why people are still buying NFTs. Uh, someone just dropped 200 ETH on the board ape when board ape is like 80 ETH. It's like 200,000 people are still buying pictures of ape because like, hey, social signaling. I'm in the in crowd right now. Uh, and lastly, and also most importantly, or rather like most commonly, people buy NFT for speculation. But before we go there, I just need to remind all of us that MAS have, a, have, have give, given us his, their guideline. And their guideline is that, hey, don't buy NFT for speculation. Uh, NFT is not suitable for retail investors. If you're looking at it as an investment, oh man, it is difficult. I, I mentioned this in my last talk. It is super difficult to trade NFT and to make money you need to be really in the space and you really need to understand the market. And even then you might not make money, right? So uh, buying NFT for speculation is a highly skilled uh, craft that not, that's not suitable for everybody. But anyway, this is one of the reasons why many people are buying NFT. They buy NFT for speculation, they get airdrops. So basically you own a board ape, early in the year you get ape coin, you get chemistry club, you get kernel, all of this, their money, right? So you buy the board ape for, I don't know, back then 40 E, you get uh, eight coin. Sorry, someone at the door. I'm going to answer that later. Um, you get the land, you get the, the dog and all that fancy stuff. All of that, so they can get more money. This is just speculation. You, you have a Zuki, you get two beans, you get a jacket. Um, you get more money. So this is why people are buying NFT. This is why people are doing airdrops or receiving airdrops. Um, they also get early access. This is quite cool. So like if you are part of a certain NFT project, you get early access to, hey, this project, this project, all the new project is coming up. You get early access to them. Why do you want early access? If you go in early, you can cash out early and you can make some money, right? Again, it is all about speculation. It's all about money making. This is one of the reasons why people are still buying NFT today. And lastly, value appreciation. If we just look at the, if we just strictly look at the ETH price, we have seen uh, do this price action starting at 1 ETH, pumping up to 5 ETH, going up to 30 ETH, now stabilizing at 15 ETH. Um, this is kind of like people are buying for the capital appreciation. Of the, of, the, of the product. So even with Azuki as well, it started off with one ETH, stabilizing at three, going up to 10, 20, 40, now, you know, um, sitting at about 15 as well. So people buy for speculation. They buy because they, they want to go in here and they want to get out here. So there's another reason why people are buying. So once again, not financial advice, MAS recommend that retail investors stay away from NFT as an investment product. But there are many, many other reasons why you would buy an NFT apart from it being an investment product. So, Quick roundup, why people are still buying NFT and is NFT for you, you know? Um, do you like it? You know, do you want to enjoy the benefits? Do you want to be associated to a brand or like, you know, you're buying it for speculation? And how much are you willing to spend just because you like it? How much are you willing to spend just because you enjoy the benefit? How much are you willing to spend just because you can be associated to a brand? And how much are you willing to risk? Because knowing that this is highly speculative, unregulated product, you might lose everything. But if you're buying it because you like it, you're buying it because you enjoy the benefits, you're buying it because you like to be associated with brand, then you know, you're not really thinking about the speculation. So this is the four reasons to buy an NFT. And this is me, hi. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, if you guys want to connect, um, just scan the QR code. Um, I do consulting. Um, I do business advisory as well for businesses trying to get into the Web3 space. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. Yes. Thanks, Broderick. Wow. As always, very informative. You had your four interesting points there when you would buy it over for the, I like the utility one though. I think that's the one that will keep us going and really make it uh, come to life in both virtual and real life. Broderick, thanks. And now we're going to go to Monse. Monse dial in early for her time, about, I think about six o'clock in the morning. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us from Spain today. She and I uh, were working and working on a, a project at IE University, uh, which was very, very uh, forward at a university space in terms of uh, metaverse and virtual reality and more. She's the CEO of Big Onion, and she's the former uh, VP and general manager of Alestria Consortium, where she does international strategy and looks at ecosystems. How do we get innovation into place? She's been focusing on AI and IoT for a long time, and especially in the oil and gas and info IT and banking and insurance. So, you know, don't be a stranger to Singapore. That's all the areas that we're focused on here as well. Monse, so glad to have you join us this morning, your time. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And also, 
after listening all the presentations, it was great because this is really what we are talking about. And I will try to summarize somehow what we have been talking all this morning with Justin, uh, Winston, and Roderick, and yourself, Professor. It's very interesting. And let me just start. Uh, I hope you see my slides. We and it's not in presentation mode yet. Not yet. Now? We see the slide. Not, not in coming. Time mode. Let me let me just check if there is an issue with the screen. Now. We see the slides, but they're in like the mode where you can design the slides. Okay, uh, it's like kind of, kind of delay, I think. Possible. Let me just try with, uh, I'm going to try with, uh, sorry, we, we tested and I don't know. Ah. Let me try to with uh, this one. Okay, I'm trying with now, better? This is good, yeah. This is good? Yeah. Let me, this is, uh, I'm changing to PDF, so let's, let's see if that goes better. One second. Apologies for that. Okay. Now? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Changing? Yes. I have changed. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So I go ahead. So let me just uh, summarize. Somehow what we have been talking about is about data. So this is about the 20th, 21st century, and we are focusing on how we manage data. It was very uh, well, well explained by Guiston. It depends how we join this data. When we give context to this data, we convert it in information. But how we give them meaning, we convert to knowledge. And finally, the perceptions, ideas around it is wisdom. So this is little bit what Broderick was saying is like how you feel with something that is completely digital and how you feel that that is growing just what he said that you make it feel it better no depending on how you want to have an nft how you want to use the metaverse you will have a little bit more more expansion of yourself in a different dimension not just the physical one so this is something that is possible because we have been improving the, the technology. We have been improving the technology for information, for telecommunication. So somehow we have a better way to do software and hardware. And that's why we are pushing us to do innovation in the way we are living, in the way we are working, in the way we are doing commerce, in the way how we are exchanging finance or having a better understanding of the financial systems around us. So, what happens right now and why it's so interesting to be attending this webinar is because we are in a very interesting moment. We are just pushing innovation because we have, as we said, no, and we see with wisdom, a new generation that has been creating this space, as Professor Carter was saying. But in the other hand, as Justin was highlighting, we need to manage risk. So at that moment, this is the balance between innovation and management of risk. So do we want to be the pioneers on that? Do we want to start up something completely new? Do we want to become the new unicorns as a company? So if we want to do so, we need to balance this risk management with this innovation, new ideas put in action. Doing so, and in this right moment, is all about decentralization is all about doing together that putting in life this idea with a lot of people and that is creating communities that's about collaboration and that's about building ecosystem is the only way that your idea can really go further with this new technology and that's something that is a lot about human beings it's not so all about any tech experience or any tech knowledge that's very important but the most important thing is how you join other areas of expertise or disciplines and that is about as we have been seen knowing very well where you are placed what is the regulation around and how you can just brush your imagination with new use cases for a broader worldwide people so that's really interesting because for doing so we need to build 
uh, a good team. We need to be very clear that what we are doing in terms of software and what we are doing in terms of creating these new spaces in the metaverse is really aligned with how is moving around the regulation on it. And also how you can be building business cases, how you create your business model. So you need these three different types of view around the idea that you may have how you build this new environment in a digital world. So what is the good news is that the technology itself is building by a lot of people around the world and is becoming more and more resilient and more and more robust. So if you are having this and you are based on using and int intended to use this blockchain network or this decentralized network, that's the first step. But the second step is just to know that this a new network, new technology, new infrastructure is going to be more and more used in a functional way for notarization. We said that with the IP, with intellectual property, with the way how you use the NFTs, but also for traceability that's very well known for logistics and e-commerce. But more and more, we are working right now in understanding digital, ID, digital identity and tokenization taking it further that we say the NFTs is more about this idea of ourselves being not just anonymous, somehow protected and have our privacy, but also being able to exchange in a much trustful, trust, trust way doing it in internet. So what about that? We have three different or more layers in Biconium, we work in layers. And in one hand, we are working, or you can work with your startup and new business in the infrastructure layer. Either you can work in defining this tokenization, in doing business, business models around tokenomics and around new ideas, but also you can involve yourself in all what it is standard reality, just making happen this new way of selling and exchanging idea and knowledge and being more wise, wise, just doing it in a way that is not just your physical world, but also this new dimension that we can get with this extended reality technology. So that is something that I think is going to happen. We are going to improve more and more in the design of these uh, di different physical elements and we are incorporated them in our physical space so maybe i will be in spain and in the future i will attend with you in singapore just being present with my avatar next to your office or next to your home so this new world is built on three things just the technology more decentralized more clear blockchain technologies around networks connected networks that is happening, but also it's happening the tokenize. We are tokenizing elements and this is creating NFTs. And finally, we are improving our view of this physical and logical world no? and just mixing together. That's something that we will see and that is going to be trustable only if we can develop this this digital identity and we have regulation around. That is something we need to understand. And that is a huge work we are doing here in Europe to just build this uh, European digital identity that will allow us travel between countries and doing some different business and also uh, enjoying some public services with this. So that is somehow the future and the future is just now as we say always because is this way of keeping building the different technologies and keeping building this interaction between what is what we want uh, to communicate and what we want to work and how we want to entertain us also making it happen with this development of the technology so this is how we are going to build this digital world no something that is a mixture between our day-to-day -day in a real life physical one and also incorporating these digital elements with our day-to-day. -day. So somehow this is what we are going to see and I'm very pleased to keep you updated in this strategy on how to build this business model, how to create your startup around that. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Monte. So good to have you here and to share that great insight and framework for us. Can I have all the speakers turn their cameras on here? 
And I enjoyed Monsa, one of the key points you talked about around how, you know, you can't do this alone. You know, regulation, research, everyone needs community, need to come together on this and it's a critical aspect. Uh, so, so good for us to be internationally yes, today. And so I'd like for um, Justin, there's one question out there that you said you were uh, very, very keen on answering. So why don't you take that up? Yeah, sure. Thanks, bro. Uh, so I'm referring to the question from Amira. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, and the question is, with the clampdown on Web2 cookie tracing, etc., uh, do we foresee similar regulations that will limit brands slash advertisers' ability to market on the metaverse? Uh, so I think this is definitely an interesting question and, and, and uh, very rightly observed by Amira that, that yes, uh, the trend in terms of data protection law is towards greater protection, uh, greater to, to, to give individuals greater control over their personal data, especially on, on the internet. Um, and it does raise a very interesting dichotomy as to how this would play out in Web3, especially, especially because in the metaverse, um, by necessity, you will need a lot more data for the metaverse to function, right? Um, so I think there, 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 is, there is clearly a, an inherent tension here. And it's definitely a question that regulators will need to think about and how, think about how to address that. What is the appropriate balance to be struck between enabling the metaverse to function as intended versus protecting individuals' rights, especially over their personal data? Um, I think ultimately there will be a middle ground drawn. Uh, I don't know where that line will be, but I think for sure uh, regulators are, 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 are um, aware of this question and are, are looking to how to address it. All right, thanks, Amira. Can we advise the regulators in any way? How can we, can the community participate in that discussion, Justin? Um, I think you're, you're, you're free to write into the PDPC in Singapore. Um, I'm not sure about how, how what's the consultation process in the EU uh, with the GDPR, uh, but I think the Singapore regulators are always open to feedback. And I think uh, when, when there are new regulations coming out, there will be public consultations as well. Okay, great. Yeah. What I'd like to do, we it, the time has gone very quickly, but super informative. I'd love to have each panelist share just a quick 30 second, you know, summary of what you believe we should take away from today's discussion. So let me start off with uh, Winston, then I'm going to go to Mansa and uh, Justin and end off with Broderick. So Winston. Yeah. On this All part. right. So, um, I guess since you're in this webinar, you're interested in the metaverse, and definitely if you're interested in the in the metaverse, go try out some of the metaverses that I've shared just now. And the first thing to understand the metaverse is actually to experience it and exposure, because um, all you can hear from a webinar is just us speaking, but you gotta try it to actually see it, actually be part of it. And I'm pretty sure that um, you enjoy it because the metaverse is something cool and exciting and it will be here to stay for a very, very long time. So, so good. Okay, Mansa. Yeah, for me, it's like we are in the beginning of the new age. So it's a transition for all of us. And some people will be very well experimented right now. And as Winston was saying, we need to go through. But the reality is that in terms of business, we need to sit down and, and just look the regulation and build it together. So we need to develop together all the, all the tech, still we have a space for that. And also at the same time, build uh, the new regulation that we can work together worldwide. And that's very interesting. I think it's a way to be, to be much more better connected widely, all of us. Okay, great connection. Okay, Justin. Yeah, so I guess my, my sort of summary takeaway here is that uh, currently the law is in its infancy. It's going to evolve. Um, how quickly it evolves remains to be seen. Uh, but it is at this stage whereby because the law is not in place, uh, there is the greatest ability to profit, but also the greatest risk. Uh, so take that as you will, uh, whether you want to venture into this space or not. Uh, and I think important to, to keep updated in terms of uh, legal regulatory developments in this space. Awesome. Robert? Yeah, for businesses, don't sleep on this. Businesses, go do your research, go study, find out ways that you can penetrate this space, you can expand your businesses through these means. That's for businesses. For retailers, I remember, right? Only spend money that you want to lose on NFTs. 
only spend money you want to lose. And uh, again, highly speculative, not recommended for investment, but amazing, amazing tool for social networking, enjoying the utility, enjoying all the live events, learning about stuff, buying art, appreciating art, lots of cool stuff. Just, you know, be a little bit more careful when you think about it as an investment or for speculation. Yeah. Roderick, I appreciate that. And Vignesh, I know that you were going to be giving us the, uh, but can you give us a quick summary from your perspective as well? Vignesh is going to be available after the session to share the hands-on portion. Vignesh. Uh, so I think, like from my perspective, it's definitely an exciting space to be in, especially as a student. So I would just say, get out there, explore and get your hands dirty. Uh, that's pretty much all I have. Okay, great. Well, listen, this has been fantastic for us to be able to all get together today. The time went so fast, but there's just so much co interesting content and I can't agree more with what's been said. We need to collaborate. You need to get your hands dirty, try it out. I'd push even a little bit further and say, design something, you know, really make a piece of clothing, uh, create a, a vehicle or something like that, or get some friends together and do it. Set up a marketplace too. Create your own NFT and so forth so that then you can come back and say, huh, you know, now I understand a bit more of how this can be used. Uh, reach out to Justin for some coffee, maybe, and ask him some legal questions. <laughs> but uh, as well as certainly, as Broderick has said, and all of us have said, be careful. Um, don't, you know, ask questions, ask more questions. And I love Broderick, that picture of you guys getting all together for coffee. Maybe we'll do that together at Gather Town as well. So Monta can join in too for us. <laughs> all right. So 